Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, January 9th, 2020. And this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank everybody for showing up today. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. I'm humbled by your presence. So what are we talking about? Wow, 18 should be 20. I don't know what happened there. Current bull leg, obviously. So far, so good. This market is climbing the wall of worry. And we'll get into that when we get to the charts. Your questions on trading, if you don't mind, just so my ADD doesn't kick in, keep them focused on the slides. And when we get to the live charts, you can ask about anything you want. Also, speaking of live charts, let me know what your favorite stock picks are, but wait until we get to the live charts, just so it doesn't get uh, buried in the questions. And also ask about one stock at a time. And that's all of this is for your benefit. So what are we talking about? Well, I want to follow up on my ongoing quest. And if I succeed, I own the world. And like I said, last week in charts back in the middle of uh, December, even if I just do okay, I'll be doing quite well. And that'll make a lot of sense in just a few minutes for those of you who missed the prior show. And then I want to start on my 20 trading resolutions for 2020. And we'll get through the first 10 of those. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or as often sum it up. All predictions are about the future and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Just a warning, I might get a fill uh, halfway through this presentation, so I may have to take a pause to put some stops in and take care of that. A little housekeeping real quick. You probably will notice that over the next year or so, there's probably gonna be some overlap with some other shows because I am, it's a good problem to have, I'm getting popular, but uh, <laughs> there's a lot of overlap. And here's the thing too, it's not like what I tell one crowd is gonna be different from what I tell the other crowd. And sometimes you have to hear it more than once. The great thing about this format is it's fairly free. I do like to keep it within certain time constraints to some extent, but for the most part, I can go off on my tangents, which I'd like to do. And I used to apologize a lot for that. And my wife would always say, hey, how'd you do? I was like, yeah, I rambled a lot, but I think I brought it all together. And I would worry about that rambling. And then somebody once said, you know, Dave, I learn a lot more from you when you just go off on your tangents and ramble. And I don't really learn as much when you're trying to teach me directly. So I think that was a compliment on that. But anyway, I have the flexibility, obviously, with this show because it's my show. And I'm paying for go to webinar. <laughs> so last time we were talking about my ongoing quest. And I know I'm going to quest is drum roll have the short-term trading pay for the long-term trading so we do a little follow-up on that and as i mentioned last time when i was talking about my money management last year i didn't think it would be um, still talking about the retreat but it was such a, a good thing and maybe we need to do one for for davelander.com that would be a pretty awesome too my wife's been hinting at that i think she's looking for a vacation Anyway, at the retreat, Charlie Kirk called the money management system that I follow, he called it free rolling once you get that profit target off. And he he liked the concept of that. It always amazes me, this simple little money management concept, which makes so much sense to me. I just thought that everybody knew that. And when I show it to people, especially like the widening of the stop in order to, to ride out longer term positions, a lot of people never really even thought of that. So. And that's why a lot of times I repeat myself quite a bit too, just because not everybody is up to speed. So last time we were looking at the current portfolio and we were free rolling on some positions. And since then, I don't think any new ones have hit the initial profit target lately, that is. But these positions here, the white means that we have taken partial profits off. You'll notice for most of the white, it's right at $1,000. And I think at this, in this particular one, it is, or, or thereabouts. But we take half of the position off for that swing trade. And in some cases, we're looking for 10 points profits. In other cases, we're looking for a little bit less. And something like a cheaper stock, of course, it's more volatile, but we're looking for a 0.7 profit, such as AUY. And the reason we take those swing trade profits, for those who are new to the methodology, is that we don't know if that longer term trend is going to continue. And here's the other thing, that's where the money is and that's where the real money is. And you'll see that we've got one position kind of leading away that KOD is up about five grand on that initial position. Now we did make the $1,000 swing trade profit and actually 
a lot of us did a lot better on that one. I don't want to rub salt in anyone's wounds who only got the exact profit target. This spreadsheet here, I keep hypothetical and I track it as close as possible to real trades and time and sales and the, the actual markets. Whereas in my own accounts, I might apply a little bit of discretion. So if you go in and watch the presentations I did on the KOD, you'll notice that I was able to get out at much, much higher levels. And some of it was luck too, because I went to get out and the, and the, the stock was halted and I just was following that stock higher intraday. Anyway, before I digress too far, so that's kind of the idea. You see, we do have the three positions at the bottom. And of course the AUI at the top, we've been sitting in forever that we're still waiting to hit that initial profit target, hopefully, and then hopefully trail that stop higher and stick with the trade for a long, long time. Maybe ping will, will ping that profit target today. One thing I've been thinking about a little bit lately that I wanted to show you, and these are some things that I, I don't cover. I've been asked about this before, and I think it's something that's important to, to point out. So to keep the math easy in this hypothetical portfolio, so to speak, I keep it always at a hypothetical 100K. So if you look at those positions on the bottom, if you were to buy into the position, you'd buy 471 shares, and usually I'll round that one way or the other per 100k and it's a perpetual 100k if we're losing money when i go to the next trade it's still 100k if we're making money like as you can see we are now with over nineteen thousand dollars in profits and some of those have been closed out in swing trades but it's only let's see one two three four five six of that well that's more than i thought it was but six thousand dollars has been taken off the table. Now, in case you're wondering, even though this trade or this half of the trade is no longer on, the reason I keep this in here is so I can visualize and you can visualize too, the entire trade. So I could say, okay, well, I'm up a thousand here and then I'm up 808, a thousand's in my pocket and I'm still up 808. So if this goes to scratch, zero in other words, I was like, well, I made a grand overall in the trade per 100K. So that's better than a poke in the eye and I can move on. So I like to keep the even though these tra this trade has already been taken off, I like to keep them in the spreadsheet just so you can see how it works out. And for me too, for that matter. Anyway, what I wanna show you here is people, it's kind of interesting and mostly people wanna be more and more invested, which I find kind of interesting. I, I'm okay with, with sitting on a pile of cash. And uh, yeah, I want to put that cash to work, but I'm also kind of anxious, for lack of a better word, to take some partial profits off the table to lighten up and then hopefully, I know I said hope, but hopefully ride the trend for a long, long time. But I'm okay without being, or I'm okay not being fully invested. But if we did add up all the margins and we took the margins out where we've taken those partial profits, for instance, on AUI, you see up there the initial margin was 49.86 and buying 14.29 shares. And again, we probably would round that one way or the other. I think I rounded it to like 2,000 or 3,000. I think 3,000 is what I did on that one per 100K. Anyway, so you're putting up, putting up roughly 5K worth of margin, and that's times two, you're putting on that whole position at once, we just divide it into two lows for tracking purposes. So you add up all that and then you take out all the margin that's no longer required for your positions that have partial profits have been taken for half of those positions, okay? So for instance, like in the KOD, you initially had to put up $4,200. Well, that $4,200 goes back into your account as free margin. Okay, plus you would get the extra thousand dollars for the swing trade in that particular case. So if you just base it on a, a perpetual 100K account, right now we have 76% of the portfolio invested. Now, if you add in the open and taken profits on these positions, then you're really only about 64% invested. Now, I do get nervous when I get quite a few positions on that haven't hit the initial profit target. So I would like to see, and obviously we always want to see, but I would feel a lot better if a couple of more of these in here banged out the initial profit target. So any questions on margin management? One question I do get a lot 
is do I use actual margin and leverage, in other words? And in some cases, the answer would be yes. I do some ogre trades and I'm slotted or considered a pattern day trader. So I do have quite a bit of margin available to me for day trading. But that aside, if you're looking at the, although I don't really want to be a day trader, I just happen to trade these open gap reversals. And I've done enough of them over a period of time to where I got slotted as a pattern day trader. It's kind of interesting. It's kind of like, you're a pattern day trader. Bad. It's like, that's bad. And, and then all of a sudden it's like, but let, let's give you five times the amount of margin so you can do it some more. <laughs> it's kind of weird the way it all goes down with that. But anyway, I don't want to digress too far. I know too late. So, but the question on actual leverage is, well, if I'm in one position and let's say it's getting fairly close to that initial profit target, like ping, for instance, well, I know I'm getting ready to free up some margin there. And let's say I have another position that looks pretty good that's worth taking, another setup, I should say. Then I'm willing to maybe go into that margin knowing that I'm in the process through ebb and flow of possibly scaling out of some other position. So it's kind of an ebb and flow. And then if going on to margin or leverage, if you want to call it that, just to not confuse it with direct margin or margin required, is okay as long as it's kind of a transition where you need that leverage to put on some new positions, but you know that you're going to take off some old positions. As a general statement, I would encourage you not to use a lot of leverage. And I'm totally okay when the portfolio is one half invested or even less. Now, in my own accounts outside of the service, and I do take those trades for what it's worth, but there's some more free rolling that I'm doing. For instance, and this is something that we talked about in the Facebook group. This one triggered at like 1084, I think for me, it was buy at close. And then the next day, knock on wood, we got a couple of points out of it and we're able to take those partial profits. And that was mentioned in the Facebook group ahead of time. And one thing I was saying in yesterday's stock chart show is my goal this year is to not show you anything that I haven't already recommended publicly and recommended publicly before I got in. I'm not going to get in something and then tell the world and try to pump and dump, even though you can make money doing that, but I think it's a little bit disingenuous. It might even be a little bit illegal, and there's some scumbags out there that are doing it. So whenever you, you're looking at a guru, and I hate that word, for lack of a better word, but whenever you're looking at a guru out there, especially if they have these claims that are too good to be true, do some internet poking around. The internet is really good sunlight, and nothing brings uh, you know, criminal activity to light, such as, what's it, sunlight? What's the old saying about uh, that? I forget. I should have even brought it up. But anyway... Notice if they've been in any legal trouble. Notice if it's a pump and dump, things like that. Anyway, so here we are with the SITM. Here's the actual trades. This is another one. And I do like to, again, show you the trades with this. And got in here, and I actually screwed this one up. I ended up placing an order that was supposed to be a limit order much, much higher. And I fat fingered it on this day. And then... There was an initial 800 shares. So, it, it again, I'm showing you a mistake here, just so you'll see that, hey, even Big Dave makes mistakes. Not that I'm that vain, but just to show you to make you feel normal because you will make mistakes and you will fat finger things. So I would have made a lot more in a position had I not fat fingered it. And then I realized that, well, wait a minute, I'm only long 400. Geez, I thought it was more. I forgot about that fat finger trade. So I sold 200 at the initial profit target. And I did that as one in this one account. Luckily, and here's, here's might be a lesson, is, is that what you might want to do is have more than one account. And there's, there's a, a plethora of reasons why you might want to do that. I don't know a lot about how SIPC works, but I think if you have all your eggs in one basket, the SIPC is only to cover so much of that. Maybe an RIA can chime in if they want to. Or not. Uh, but anyway, I wanted to, one thing I learned from this trade is it's good to have multiple accounts because if you screw up in one, it might wake you up to what you're doing in the other. And here you can see that 800 shares was bought at 2050 
and then 400 shares, 300 plus 100 was flipped out at 24 and change for about a three and a half or so point profit on that. So I did, I didn't screw up everywhere, but I did screw up in one account on that. And you can see this one worked out okay. Bought 100 market on close, sold 400, and now we're coming in. And this is we're free rolling on this position, but as you can see, it's come in quite a bit, and we could get stopped out. And so be it. You know, you have to be willing to say slow, so long and thanks for all the fish. And one thing I was thinking about this morning is, I know, I know, easier said than done, hard to do without dropping an F-bomb sometimes. But the other thing is like, okay, so long and thanks for all the fish. That's a decent amount of money over a very short period of time. Annualize, I know it's dangerous to play the annualization game, but annualize, that's quite a bit of money. If you could do that quite often, okay, even if it's just a thousand bucks per 100K, but do that 10, 15, 20, 30 times a year, it'll start to add up. And then the other thing is, if you do get stopped out in a remainder, well, that cleans up the margin or frees up the margin, I should say. And then now you have more cash to go out and find another one of these. Speaking of another one of these, this is one that we just picked up recently. A few of you guys played along in the Facebook group. And again, I want to point out that almost anything I show you, occasionally I was thinking about it this morning, maybe an ogre or nobody got reversed. So I'm not, I might not report all of those, although lately I have in the Facebook group, what I'm looking at. But as I said a second ago, I do want to make sure that anything I talk about, I talk about before I actually get into it. So anyway, OCFT as a five-day SMA buy and an IPO, and I need a better name for that thing. And I put on the Facebook group that it was a go, and then you could see we went back and forth on that, and we kind of needled with a little bit. This turned into be a pretty good trade. We had Landry Light. I think it was on the first trading day of the year, or was it six? No, it was on the sixth. And then we had a close at a new closing high. And according to the rules for this pattern, you need to have Landry Light with a five-day simple moving average. That's it, okay? And a close at a new closing high. But that close also has to be greater than the high of day one. So you can see the high of day one was 10 and change. If the high of day one was much lower, then we just totally ignore that day one. In other words, during the first week of trading, if the high sets the high for the week, or I guess it could also be the all-time high, then with these patterns, such as buy a D and the five-day SMA buy, Landry Light thing, then it also has to close above that day one high. And when all that occurs, you want to buy market on close. And as I mentioned earlier, I just got to fill with something, so let me go see what's going on there. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, that's what it was. Uh, Zach pointed out SOX just triggered and I wasn't able to get my orders in. So that's one of the downsides of the <laughs> weekly webinar. So we just have to keep a loose eye on it. Anyway, getting back to the OCFT, you could see that the day before the closing high was a brand new closing high. Yeah, I actually fat fingered an order trying to, trying to, uh, put in my trailing stop and in initial profit target. So, which I had to like, I got out and got back in. I guess, thank God I got all that day trade margin. <laughs> Laugh to keep from crying. But anyway, you'll see the day before it was a new closing high. And even the day before that was a new closing high, even though you didn't have Landry Light, that would have been a buy at B. But it's not greater than the high of day one, okay? So let's say day one high was right here. If these two bars were flip-flop, then we wouldn't even worry about the day two high or whatever high for the week it was. But when day one high sets a high, we need to pay careful attention to that. So here's the OCFT. Here's the take partial profits. So now we're free rolling, so to speak, on that one. And then here's what it looks like now. I took this little snapshot right before I went live with the chart show. Now, let's talk about 20 trading resolutions for 2020. 
And I'm gonna go through the first 10 today. I will only take trades when conditions are conducive to my methodology with a few little caveats. But as a general statement, as a trend follower, you want the market to look like it looks right now. It's been going up for quite a while. It's been going up in somewhat of a persistent fashion. I need to talk to Dave Keller and find out who he was quoted, but quoting, but he said in one of his recent shows that he likes, he had a mentor that told him that he likes trends that he doesn't need his eyeglasses to see. And that would be like right now in the S&P 500 and most sectors. Now there are a few caveats and I'm, I'm gonna flesh out a few of these uh, with actual trades in a minute. But the caveats are one, A, unless I think I have the mother of all setups. So if you've got a fantastic setup, and the sector doesn't confirm, and the overall market doesn't confirm, then by all means, take it. If you're feeling that F yeah, like man, this thing looks fantastic, then by all means, take the trade. In less than ideal conditions, on anything else, then pass. Now, let's say you have a decent looking stock that can trend in lieu of conditions. In other words, let's say it's a commodity related stock, so it's a gold stock, and gold stocks are doing pretty good, and you got a pretty good looking setup in the gold stock, and the market might be iffy. In fact, the market being iffy could actually be a good thing, okay, if you want to get into the intermarket technical analysis, which you have to be a little bit careful with, but that's a story for another day. Learn it, but just be careful in how you apply it, because it works when it works, okay? It doesn't always work, though, but there are some relationships that do tend to work over the long run, but over the long run, eh, a little hard to trade off of that. Anyway, before I digress too far, the other case would be if you have a possible transitional setup that could be leading the market. Right now, if you're on a trading service, you know that the weed stocks, you probably know this outside of it, but all these weed stocks are headed down or headed lower, except there are a couple that are bottoming out. And these might be the cream that begins to rise to the top. So I am looking at some of these weed stocks at low levels. So if you have a possible transitional setup, in other words, an emerging trend, even if the sector's headed lower or the market's questionable, this stock could trade in lieu or ignore the overall sector action. And I'll give you a, a couple of cases and points. Uh, a while back, the market was kind of right around new highs, but those shorts that you see in the portfolio, anything with minus one, by the way, is a short, and anything with a plus one is a long, but those shorts were put on, the market was still near new highs, even though the market overall looked okay, the shorts were beginning to show up, so I thought it was okay to take those, and they were transitional setups, meaning emerging trends. So if you have the mother of all setups, if you have a decent looking setup in a commodity related stock or something you think can trade contra to the overall market, and if you have a transitional setup that could be developing an emerging trend type of pattern. So I went back over the summer and there was actually been quite a few periods this year. I was just by accident noticed that my end of year review that I did for stock charts, that there were back in November, I went two weeks or so before we had caught the mother of all trades by by doing absolutely nothing but i knew summertime wasn't fantastic the market had gone sideways forever and then it began to sell off a little bit it started looking questionable again but there were no trades during that entire period and it doesn't look like much on the chart but it was over half of august every day i come in okay guys can't find anything and like i said in the stock charts show recently or yesterday, in fact, in the back of my mind, I'm wondering, I'm wondering if clients are wondering why they are paying me to tell them to do nothing. And as I said yesterday, I would gladly pay for someone to do the analysis. And after all that analysis, tell me, hey, you know what? The best thing for you to do is just sit on your hands. That's that's very important. Hard to quantify that, but if you start losing a bunch of money taking a bunch of mediocre setups, you'll learn really quick the value of doing nothing. And real quick, I know I kind of beat the dead horse on this. I've told it so many times to you guys. But back when I was in, affiliated with a large website, one of the first financial websites out there, 
we I started a trading service with them. All of this kind of happened all by accident, but that's kind of a two drink minimum story. But anyway, the salespeople would call me up when I wouldn't recommend anything. They're like, Dave, we're losing clients. You got to recommend something. And I'm like, well, no, I'm I'm not doing anything. So why should they? And, and the salespeople really had a hard time with that because they lived off commission. But what's interesting is if I recommended some turds, <laughs> They wouldn't lose clients and that just tells me right there that people are trading for action so anyway we went a couple of weeks without a trade almost half of august and then the aui sets up now aui not the most perfect example because it really hasn't made a whole lot of money for us yet but it's a good example of a stock that was worth taking it was a gold stock was trending nicely pulled back Pretty good setup, pretty clean setup for a gold stock. By the way, commodity stocks tend to be a little choppier than regular stocks. You, you can be a little bit more lenient with those guys. So anyway, after a couple of weeks of no trades, we found AUY, and I figured it was worth a shot. My second trading resolution for 2020 is I will carefully plan all trades ahead of time and then work diligently to follow that plan. Plan thy trade and trade thy plan. Now, in spite of me saying, let's get in here, let's take initial profits here, let's put a stop here. Now, there will be a little discretion here and there. Sometimes that profit target, sometimes the market will come within a point or so, or a penny or so, I should say, of the profit target. Then, and it just can't seem to get there, then it might be worth taking profits slightly earlier, or a stop might get nicked, and then the market immediately reverses. And if you're using a little discretion and alarms and alerts, things like that, it might be okay to stay with that stock on a case-by-case -case basis. You have to take that obviously on a case-by-case -case basis. What I'm talking about here is just a complete disregard for the plan. A little discretion, as you know, can really improve your results. But a complete disregard for the trading plan, that's a whole nother story. And no matter how carefully I do everything, by saying, let's get in here, let's take profits here, let's put a stop here. I get flooded with a bunch of emails. It's not as bad as it used to be, uh, truth be told, since I think everybody's a little bit more up to speed on everything. I think the learning management system has helped and a little tough love for me, uh, which is something I've never done until more recent times, just because I want everybody to be successful. And sometimes you need a little tough love. Anyway, long story endless. Hey, I didn't take that XYZ trade. Is this still a buy? Now it's up two bucks. ABC hit the stop yesterday. It's selling off even more today. And usually these emails are like, I'm freaking out. I'm panicking. What should I do? And then I didn't take those partial profits, but now the stock is selling off hard. What should I do now? Well, as you can see, all of this creates stress and angst and frustration. And all of that comes from not following the plan. Trust me, trading is frustrating enough. I just fat figured an order, okay? I just sold half of my SOXX and then had to jump right back in midstream. I don't even want to know what it cost me. <laughs> so that's frustrating enough in and of itself. Hopefully, I know you said hope, but hopefully the position will wash out all that. But that's, a, that's exhibit A of how aggravating and frustrating trading can be. Okay, now you can argue, well, Dave, you probably should be trading doing a webinar. It's like, well, I had to do it. Yeah, I'm watching it. I got it, I got it open on the screen, Zach. I appreciate that. Uh, you know, probably should be trading a webinar. Well, I'm actually following my plan because a trigger happened during a webinar and I have to put in an initial profit target and I have to put in a trailing stop. Now, although I make it sound kind of exciting today, Trading done properly can often be quite boring. And as I often joke, we're really more waiters than we are traders because we sit around and wait and wait and wait. At least the longer you're at this and the better you become at this, the more you find yourself doing less and less. It's a little bit ironic, don't you think? <laughs> But I find myself, other than the occasional opening gap reversals, I find myself being more and more selective and less and less active. Now, now is not a good time to point that out because I probably got on a dozen positions. But there will be times where I'll be 100% in cash 
as I was over the summer, waiting and waiting and waiting for setups. So you really can avoid, as I kind of alluded to a minute ago, you really can avoid putting yourself into a state of regret by following the well thought plan. Believe me, there's going to be plenty and plenty, 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 plenty states of regret and trading, but you can eliminate quite a few of those by planning the trade ahead of time and following the plan. I know it's cliche, but you have to do it. Dave, why do you preach so much about following the trading plan? Because you're not following the trading plan. <laughs> Number three, I will only take trades that trigger an entry. Stanley Druckenmiller, and as I said yesterday, I, I realized that the photo I had of Mr. Druckenmiller has a $200, maybe per use, <laughs> with some all other um, caveats attached to it. So I had to make sure that I took Mr. Druckenmiller's photo out, and, and this is my best impression of him. He's worth uh, four or five billion, I think, maybe a little bit more. So I put some money in his hands. Anyway, he said the way to build long-term returns is through preservation of capital and home run. Amen, my brother from another mother. I fully agree. And what am I doing with my methodology that I preach? What am I doing with money management that I preach? Well, first of all, preservation of capital, I'm not putting into any capital into harm's way on a mediocre setup and if i do i kick myself in the butt and i beat my believe me i'm, I'm harder on myself than anyone out there sometimes I'm, i think i might be a little too hard on myself because i should know better sometimes what i do and that's why i'm like boy do you really want to take this mediocre setup and and one thing you could do as i've said before but one thing you could do is time travel when you're looking at a setup you're looking at a setup and time travel and imagine yourself getting knocked out of that position or so or, or worse i should say stopped out of that position think about how you would feel would you really be pissed off if the answer is yes then don't take the position if you look at it and say you know what i don't care if i get stopped out on this because if i saw the same position tomorrow and i've said this before and before but i'm gonna keep saying it until you people get it but if i saw the same setup again tomorrow i would take it and if you can put yourself in the mindset at that future self of yours, whenever that position stops out and say, well, you know, I think it was worth a shot. I did what I was supposed to do and I'll do it all over again. But Mr. Drucker Miller says the way to build long-term returns is through preservation of capital and home run. So that's a few things. Number one, being super duper selective. So A, you won't have a lot of trades and B, you'll be more likely to catch that home run the other thing that you do is through the money management, we're preserving capital. In fact, a lot of times we'll make a little stop out, make a little stop out. I mean, if that happened on every trade, you'd eventually own the world because you'd eventually hit a few off the park. We do occasionally lose on trades, obviously, more often than I care to <laughs> or want to, obviously. But position yourself by taking the short-term profits, you're growing your account over time, and you're also position yourself for that occasional home run. And that makes all the difference in the world. So by waiting for entries, that keeps you out of a lot of trouble. Now this example is a little dated, but it makes for a great example. We had this really good looking setup in this IPO and the entry was up here. And then what happened? Nothing, it did not trigger. It went sideways to lower for the next week or so. And then what's interesting is I backed that chart way out and you could see that it ended up imploding, but it never did trigger. Now, here's another one of those beat the dead horse things. I'll get an email from somebody. I probably got an email on this one. I should go search. I don't know if my Outlook goes back that many years, but I should go search my Outlook and see for this ticker to see if somebody said, Dave, I'm down 90% in FRTA. What should I do? It's like, FRTA, that's a turd. I wouldn't recommend that. Why would why would you say that I recommended that? And after a few little interactions back and forth, it's like, you did recommend it. And they give me a day and a time and I go back and look. It's like, well, I sure did, but it never did trigger. So no capital was put into harm's way. Number four, I will pick the best and leave the rest. Another one of those cliche things. 
and I just kind of backed into that, is the stock trending? Is the stock accelerating in the trend? Is the stock persisting in its trend? Persistency, if you don't learn anything from me, learn persistency, okay? And that's something that you might argue with what I do and how I do it, but I don't think you can argue with the power of persistency. And that just means that a stock tends to go up day after day after day. So in picking the best and leaving the rest, if the stock looks like electrocardiogram, then you need to pass. So here's the gold stock, the TKO, um, uh, a TKO and AUY. And notice that this stock, draw your big blue arrow. Again, you don't need, I could take off my glasses right now and I can still see this trend with my old eyes. And as we look back at this trend, notice that it all started with a gap. And notice that it was trending higher in a persistent way, meaning that you could draw a line through almost all of the bars. And also notice that it is accelerating higher. Now, for those who are mathematically inclined, persistency is mathematically equivalent to linear regression, but I just like to draw a line through as many bars as possible. And if I'm just doing my own analysis, I'll just eyeball it. I won't even draw a line, but when I'm teaching, I'll put a line in the chart like I did here. So again, persistent and accelerating, and that's a good thing. And also that TKO should stand out like a sore thumb. I get questions all the time, and it's probably my own fault because in my early books, I wrote about a TKO just being a two bar low. I think I might've been a little too caught up in the momentum of the market at the time, and I wasn't really looking for as much perfection and perfect hindsight. You do want that TKO to be big enough to make sure some people got knocked out of the market and to make sure, and not in a case like this in a low price stock, but in a higher price stock, make sure that some shorts likely got sucked in. As I often preach, our job with technical analysis is to take advantage of the predicament of others' emotions, provided, of course, we can embrace our own. So let's take a look at PLMR. You could see that nice little TKO there. Again, not, not as big as the AUY, but it still sticks out like a sore thumb. You should be able to see that even without your glasses, as Dave Keller's mentor once said. Nice uptrend in, intact. And then if we start drawing our little lines, you could see it kind of took off, went sideways, took off again, and then it began to accelerate higher so it did have a bit of a slow start but then it became very persistent and accelerating and even though it did consolidate going sideways a little bit it did nothing wrong it just kind of caught its breath before it took off took off again i think it's uh i forget who says it i i used to say it all the time then i realized it's ralph akampora is that how you say his name it's the bigger the base the bigger launch in the space so there's nothing new under the sun every time i think i discover something i come on a cutesy saying I found out that somebody else has been there before me. Anyway, CMRE is a shipper. Shippers tend to be a little choppy, but then this stock kind of got its act together. And look at that TKO. You should be able to see that from a mile away. And notice that as we start backing up in time, you can see that the trend wasn't that great for a while, but then it starts working its way higher. And then it begins to do what? Persist and accelerate higher before that TKO moves down. And that's, all my patterns kind of go together, or not all the time, but sometimes. Sometimes you have a persistent pullback that's also a TKO, that's also the accelerating momentum strategy. Accelerate, accelerating momentum strategy, easy for me to say, is simply what you see here with these blue arrows where you have a gradual uptrend that, talks, that, that turns into a more accelerating uptrend. So here's T and K, another shipper that was kind of all over the place, but then began to get its act together. After a really nice run, more than doubling in value, it begins to sell off and pull back. But notice the trend here again went from a gradual trend to a somewhat more parabolic trend. Now, if you go way back in time, it's kind of all over the place, basing out, but that's okay. It was kind of getting its act together, but there's nothing to do when it looks kind of like an electrocardiogram like that. But then, when its personality begins to change, it begins to accelerate higher, it's worth a shot. If you know me, you probably know that I'm not a big fan of trading shippers, although we are along too right now. And the reason is years ago, I did a lot of research and trend and then 
many years after that, I, I dusted off my computer one day and did a little programming and found out that the shippers really don't trend that well. And that makes sense because they're commodity related. But when they go, they can go. So you can't just trade them all the time on a trend following basis. But if you pick your spots carefully, they're worth a shot. So here's another one. This is an IPO. And we have a TKO slash pullback in this one. And you look a little bit back in time, you say, oh, okay, it had a nice little gap higher. Nice little breakout characteristic to it. Again, it's an IPO. And we're actually on Profit Watch on this one. Or we were before I got started. And my deal with IPOs is I'm a little bit more of a breakout player here, even though this is more of a core methodology pullback type of setup. And that's why I recommend it in the service. But with IPOs, I have observed and have traded quite a bit that when they start making brand new highs, sometimes you just close your eyes and buy them like I did with the SITM and the ORCT. So good looking setup, has a potential to go to brand new highs as an IPO, and I'm a huge fan of that. Now, it didn't really start out too great. It was kind of like a, a die and a die. It just came public. The high was set on the second day of trading, and then it just died out and based, okay? But sometimes these die, die, and fly patterns can work out nicely. What happens is sometimes these stocks come public a little too early or market conditions might be a little adverse or some news event might enter the market, which kind of mucks things up for them or something could happen, okay? And it could also be company-based. It could be some reason with the company that they missed their first earnings or something or they had a little stumble in the company as, a, as startups can have, but then they get their act together. Okay, the question is, aren't gaps at the beginning of the trend not as preferable is gaps mid-trend? Well, it shows character of the market. And we're looking for what I call trend qualifiers. And it means that the stock is persisting, the stock is accelerating, there's some gaps and things. But but yeah, gaps, I guess, closer to where you're trading are probably better than gaps that are further away to answer your question on that. So that's a good question. And again, as I said earlier, it wasn't too good to begin with, but then it became pretty darn good. In fact, it became great. And again, notice the persistent move higher, even though this was a little volatile in that persistent move higher, for the most part, you could draw a line through most of the bars. Now, PGNY, another IPO, pulled back, looked pretty good. And again, it's an IPO. And if it could just make it to 31 and change, then we're back at brand new highs. And that would certainly be a good thing. Now, here's something that I've done in the past, which I think makes a heck of a lot of sense. And you could plot like a one bar moving average if you wanted to or something, or just plot a closing price. But one way of doing it also would be just draw your lines and then intersect as many bars as possible. So obviously this thing sold off, this thing went sideways, this thing took off, and then what happened? It pulled back, okay? So all I did was draw a line through as many of those bars as possible. And when you take the chart out, that's a good looking setup, okay? So when in doubt, take the chart out. Number five, I will be patient. Now, as I said earlier, trading done properly can be boring. And as Tom Petty once sang, God rest his soul, the waiting is the hardest part. So Tom Petty knew what it felt like to be a trader. Now, there's three forms of patience. The patience to wait for your pitch, the patience to wait for a setup to trigger, and the patience to wait for a position to move. Let's break it down. The patience to wait for your pitch. I'm not a huge sports fan, although, as I said yesterday, I can occasionally be found in the nosebleed section at a Saints game, as I did last Sunday. <laughs> and I, I was crying a little bit. But for the most part, I'm not a big, big sports fan. 
But from what I understand, from reading a little bit on the internet, I learned that a fat pitch is a pitch that you must swing at as a batter. And a fat pitch looks like a big old cabbage ball coming at you for, for the batter. So you have to take these fat pitches when they come at you. Just like if you think you have the mother of all setups, and ideally, again, you want the market and sector to confirm and other stocks within the sector to confirm, but if you think you have the mother of all setups, then by all means, take it. That might be that fat pitch, okay? But on anything else, and I thought I would go one presentation without saying it, but I guess I won't, because people are starting to quote me on it. It's not me. It's Market Wiz. It's Ed Sakota. You have to not confuse intuition with into wishing. And it's tough. I mean, there's a lot of pressures that are put on us to perform, okay? And we're always going to need money, okay? If you have children, you're going to need even more money. <laughs> you marry guys, you're going to need some money. Oh, so many things I like to say. <laughs> good things, though. good things, mostly good, as far as you know. Now, one thing that I used to do, if you know me, I've said this quite a bit, and my question is always, or used to be always, why do the same people who strive for perfection in life settle for such mediocrity in markets? So, for instance, a surgeon who, a surgeon obviously has to be very perfect in what he does in his work, and people who care about the quality of their work at all and, and try to be as perfect as possible, they get into the market and they take any old crappy position. And it's like, why? Why would you not wait until conditions are better? Why are you taking these crappy positions? And I would ask that nearly every webinar. Go back and look at some old webinars on YouTube and on the learning management system even. I might have actually posed that question. And then finally, a psychiatrist emails me, very nice of her, and she said, I think I can answer the question about why highly trained and skilled professionals can't seem to get the chart reading slash trading thing. I am a physician who specializes in psychiatry. Doctors, lawyers, and mechanics are trained to take whatever train wreck comes along and fix it. We're expected to do something immediately regardless of the conditions and despite the possible negative outcomes of our action. As a physician, if you dwell too much on the potential negative outcomes, you will become a deer in the headlights and not be able to function. So we tend to minimize the negative aspects of situations. Waiting for the perfect pitch is not what we are trained to do. So you may have had 10, 20, 30 years or more of bad training for trading. And as I often say, real world, trading world, two different worlds but it was very nice of Dr. J to enlighten me on this. And the clincher here is we have no training to prepare us for sitting on our hands and waiting. It is simply not part of the mindset. Trading is unnatural. Trading feels unnatural. Even though I've been at this forever, and some days I have a blast doing it, okay? If that SOX X continues to follow through, maybe I'll be happy. Not that the market should control my mood, but it does a little bit. Your trading will spill over into your regular life, and your regular life will spill over into your trading. But for the most part, it's it's unnatural, even though I've been doing this for a long time. It still feels unnatural. You have to learn to embrace and accept the unnatural nature of it. Maybe that's a whole webinar in and of itself, the unnatural nature of trading. Well, it's going to look a lot like the other webinars I've done where I talk about how the real world and the trading world are different worlds. The second form of patience is the patience to wait for a setup to trigger. Many, 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 many times I recommend the stock and people tell me the next day they got in it. And I'm like, well, it never triggered. Well, I decided to get in a little early. Well, you're, you're trying to beat the system and front running a setup is a bad idea, unless, of course, you're in the most crazy, rip roaring bull market of all times, then just buy at all costs at any price, whatever, it doesn't matter. But 99.9% .9 of the rest of the time, you want to make sure you're waiting for that trigger. And the last time we had such a market, by the way, was 1999. So here's that KOD trade. I'm probably going to beat this one to death, as you know, but no trigger, no trigger, no trigger, no trigger. 
we had the Thanksgiving holiday, and then what happens? It finally triggers. You have to be patient and wait for that trigger. Now, the reason you have to wait for it is like that, was it FRTA trade or whatever one I showed earlier, is sometimes they don't trigger and then go down to zero. The other example, and I nearly miss this one, and I want to think, I forget, I think it was one of the Chris's in the Facebook group pointed out, but no trigger, 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 and then bam, thing takes off 60% in one day. And I actually got tired of putting orders in. I didn't feel like putting an order in that last day, and then one of you guys pointed it out, and I keep forgetting who it was, so my apologies. If you hear one of the Chris's, let me know. Number three, the patience to wait for a position to move. And this is tough for many. This is the ongoing dead money report. And I hope, and I just said hope, but I hope that AUI turns into the mother of all dead money reports. As you can see, it triggered, took off a little bit, but then went sideways for months and months and months. What do we do? Nothing. You let that stop get taken out. If it goes down, it hits it. And you keep it in to keep you, to hopefully keep you in. I know I said hope. You do want to look for perfection going into a trade, okay? Don't take whatever train wreck comes along. But then once you get in, let the chips fall where they may. If you start trying to outsmart the market, you can get into a lot of trouble really, really, really fast. Now, here's a mic drop moment. A few months back, I waited and I waited and I waited and I waited and I waited. And I forget what trades it was. It probably, I can go back and look at my records. It was probably like an opening gap reversal or something. And it's kind of like the Jimmy Rogers. All I do is just sit there and wait. And when I see some money lying in the corner, I walk over there and pick it up. And it was one of those days where I came in and after not trading for weeks, I'm like, you know what? I can't stand it. This this trade looks so damn good. I'm going to take it. Took it and made money. And then it's like, you know, trading is so damn easy. I woke up the next day. Trading is so effing easy when I wait for the best setups, take them, and then follow my trading plan. I might want to write that down. So if you can wait and wait and wait and wait and wait and then follow the plan, you you win for sure. Easier said than done, though. All right, let's count the number of times Dave used the word hope in trading today. Yeah, I'm using that word a little bit too much. Huh? That's a four-letter word in trading, huh? <laughs> so I'm, right now, I'm hoping that SOXX uh, hangs in there before I get, start getting my orders in on that. Number six, I will do my homework, leaving no stone unturned. So for me, that means looking at a couple of thousand charts daily. And I really enjoy looking at the look at that stock charts for me it's like being on a treasure hunt because if i if i find the right stock it's going to be worth thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars for me and even if i find one that's just kind of mediocre it might be worth at least a thousand bucks okay per 100k so i might pick up a few thousand bucks on it all right yeah it is always a risk but without risk you can never get reward right Ships uh, are safe in the harbor, but that's not what they're made for, right? Not saying put capital in harm's way unnecessarily, but if you have a setup, if you see a setup, if you see a chance, a good chance, as Steve Winward said, you take it. So anyway, part of those 2,000 charts is obviously a lot of stocks, but I'm also looking at some sectors. I take a look at the dollar, the gold, and any other relevant commodities at the time. Might look at oil or something. And then I run these loose parameter scans, which produce probably about 1,500 stocks. And I'm also looking at, obviously, the indices, ETFs, and, of course, some IPOs. So this is my daily routine. And sometimes it's amazing, like the SITM and OCRT. I think that's that symbol. Those are little trades where I spent 10 minutes, about 30 minutes before the close, looking at some fresh IPOs for buy at D and five day SMA patterns. And knock on wood, they paid off nicely so far. Number seven, I will trade the charts and ignore all other extraneous information. It's kind of a read my lips type of thing. I ignore all news. But Dave, what about the earnings? I ignore all news. 
Dave, what about Brexit? I ignore all news, okay? Your life's gonna get a lot easier. Speaking of Brexit, as I wrote at DaveLander.com, anybody get that wrong, okay? And I actually talked to some of my mates over there in England. They explained to me that a lot of people didn't want to answer the surveys truthfully because they didn't want to be seen as, and I don't know, I mean, racist is always thrown around as a common term nowadays. Uh, it's, I think it's overused. But that's another story anyway for getting into trouble but you, they didn't want to be seen as racist i think is what uh, this gentleman told me about uh the brexit so a lot of people got that wrong it's this is not to say that news does not affect the markets it does okay but you don't know for a fact which way it's going to affect the market even if you knew the news ahead of time okay you know trump winning the presidency because that was such an upset should have drove stocks lower but what happened after the future was down overnight i think stocks ended up higher you know an event like that really should have not that his presidency is good or bad okay let me stay on that little fine line right there but that shock so to speak to the market should have drove the market lower but it didn't number eight i will place a protective stop after a trade triggers well i'm violating my law right now my rule because I can't get to my screens. <laughs> do as I say, not as I do. And the reason you want to use a protective stop is, and here's here's some Dave Landry horse beating, <laughs> classical big Dave, is because nobody knows exactly what a market will do. Not you, not me, and certainly not the guy who screams on TV. Although I haven't listened to the guy who screams on TV in a long, long time. <laughs> So maybe he's become a little bit better than he used to be. But anyway, we all could be wrong in a trade. We all know that. Number nine, I will take partial profits when offered. A lot of times, all you get is that partial profit. And a lot of times, as I said earlier, a lot of people will call me up. Oh, Dave, I missed that partial profit. What do I do now? Well, now you put yourself into a state of regret. What you should have done and what you should do in the next trade is take those partial profits when offered. And a lot of times you get what I call the better than the poke in the eye trade where you win and scratch out. Well, if you can win and scratch out over and over, okay, or quite a bit more than you lose, right? Then longer term, you're going to own the world because eventually you're going to knock it out the park on a setup. Your friend Larry Connors doesn't use stops. Well, that's probably the old Larry when he was doing the mean reversion type of trading. Last time I checked, I think he's a trend follower. I think he's come over to the dark side. I don't want to speak for Larry and get in a lot of trouble. But uh, if you Google him, I think he's running money as a trend follower. But um, yeah, I'd be interested, Frenchie, in learning more about the fact that he doesn't use stops. Not a big fan of not using stops. In fact, Larry and I, early in the day, we were trying to come up with a buy line when I was writing for trading markets. And we started talking about, well, we don't want these guys getting in trouble. And between the two of us, we decided that it would probably be a good idea to put protective stops on every trade as my buy line, as a PS in every column. So if you go back, I don't know if those columns still exist, but years and years ago, those columns all ended with protective stop on every trade. Then I thought, may the trend be with you is even better. Number 10, I will not take any unnecessary action, thereby micromanaging myself out of trades. Now, the reason it's taken me so long to get through these resolutions is every resolution here can be multiple presentations or at least a presentation in and of itself. I've talked a lot about monetizing trades and we're all a little guilty of doing that okay but you got to be really careful to just follow the plan the minute you start counting your money you begin thinking well i can pay off this credit card or i could pay my mortgage or my rent or whatever you have do okay with that money as opposed to letting it grow and your trading account the other thing people do 
is dead money. That's why I do so many dead money reports because a lot of people get into trades and they're like, well, it's not working. I'm in this thing a week, not making any money. I better just get out. No, just follow the plan. Your life will get a lot easier when you follow the plan. The other thing people do is they try to outsmart the markets. They try to get out on the high and occasionally that will work, okay? Make you feel pretty good. But then one day I can all but guarantee you're going to wake up and that stock's going to double overnight and you're going to be sitting there with your mouth open because you were in that trade the day before but thought it was a little too high. And I've seen this happen many a times. I'll get emails. You know, Dave, the market was up big today and that stock was actually down a little bit. Something's wrong. I'm, I'm getting out. It's like, well, okay. You know, I'm going to follow the plan. And sometimes I'll get stopped out. You know, it happens with a silent SH, but I'm gonna just follow the plan and stick with it because if you quit, you're never gonna win big. So micromanagement, one of the biggest sins that I see. Getting back to that AUI, August, September, October, November, Thursday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, <laughs> been in this thing forever, but I'm gonna stick with it and we'll see. And here comes hope again, Frenchie. Hopefully, it turns into the mother of all dead money reports. As long as I'm not stopped out, stay the course. So again, perfection going in, let the chips fall where they may. If you want to see some of these trades that I talk about, you can review the archives from a service. Obviously, if you're on the service, it's below the service. And if not, this URL has been shortened to davelander.com slash archives. Okay. And then I just put the recent batch in there so they're going to be fairly new sans any brand new setups if you need to go look at those if you want to go look at them you get really bored i'd recommend you do that so you can see what i see what i saw when i saw it let me get my tense right okay what i saw when i saw it and you can see that i didn't have any hindsight whatsoever with those positions and a lot of times it's warts and all you're going to see some losing trades there that i can guarantee I don't remember what announcements were. If you haven't already done so, become a member of DaveLander.com. And once you do that, join the Facebook group. We have a great bunch of traders over there. I am humbled to hang around with you guys. And it has helped me out tree tremendously. Like I said earlier, I, the trade I would not have uh, bothered to put an order for. After putting an order for 10 days, I would have missed that trade. I've picked up an IPO or two from you guys. I've picked up an idea here and there. So thank you for that. And if you are not a member of DaveLander.com, come remember for 47 bucks a month. And then after you do that, join us in the Facebook group. Facebook group is free. You have to be a member of DaveLander.com and that's just to keep the riffraff out. If you've ever been part of groups, I'm half kidding, but if you ever been part of groups, they get kind of diluted and ugly and stupid really fast but this group has been really coherent and focused and i don't want to go on and on because i'll get a little too sappy on you all right any individual stocks that you guys want me to look at we'll take a look at the market let me shift gears and get my screen shared any questions any thoughts music anecdotes well, zach what was your plan to sell that do you just was that your plan going in or you just sold it because you were up a little money? You, did you mentally monetize that and think I, I can go buy me a motorcycle with that? Is that why you did that? Or I don't want to pick on you, but it'd be kind of make a good, yeah. So you mentally monetized. Now you might've gotten out at the exact high. Zach told me he just sold his uh, SOXX at 2050 or whatever. And he picked up what, half a point? No, uh, 40 cents, not a bad little day trade. But, you know, what's your plan? You know, my, my goal with something like an opening gap reversal is to catch a trend intraday and ride it as long as possible. So if that was your plan going in, then you did the right thing. If you just got, if you just wanted to go buy a motorbike, then uh, Zach wants a motorbike. <laughs> then, uh, eh, I don't know. You just follow the plan from now on. All right, let's take a look at the P's. Look at that. Nice persistent uptrend remains intact. We can, as I said earlier, the for those who are more mathematically inclined, 
do a linear regression on that. This top line is a linear regression. And this bottom line is just a little line I drew through the bar. So you can see that they pretty much look the same. And I could probably fidget my line to make it more accurate. So you want to use, just use a trend line and draw it through as many bars as possible. But nice persistent uptrend remains intact. Remember, we stayed last year, specifically last summer, when I wasn't recommending a whole lot of action and even a few shorts. There was really not a whole lot to do. And then finally, the market takes off. And begin setting up. Many traders trade options instead of stocks. What do you think? Well, it's a big can of worms, Rose. And I'll give you, if you email me, I'll give you temporary access to my learning management system. And I've done plenty of uh, presentations on options, specifically and mostly under the Q&A section. I'll also give you my second book, first book, where I have a chapter on options. Options are really tricky. And it's a big can of worms, okay? So I would tread lightly, but uh, sometimes deep in the money calls and, and especially on the short side, deep in the money puts can be worthwhile, but then you've got decay and rolling and all kinds of problems like that. And, and it just becomes, again, a can of worms. NASDAQ composite, look at that. Bam, winning up over half percent today off its best levels, coming in a little bit, but so far so good on that one. If we can hang around where we are now, we're at all time highs. Let's take a look at the Rusty. Rusty bringing up the rear. Well, not really just yet. It's trying to rally out this pullback, but it doesn't have a lot of vigor right now. While we're here, let's take a look at gold. Gold, you would think, would be headed higher given the news events, right? And so far it is, but it's reversing a little bit, even though things have seemed like they're taking a turn for the worse. Now, in the sectors, let's take a look at energies. Energies looking pretty good, just pulling back a little bit in here. I am starting to see some energies bottom out. Gold, the stocks looking pretty good, okay? Silver's looking even better, but that's kind of a small sector. But you can see so far breakout pullback remains in place there. Silver, same sort of thing. Nice, nice breakout, nice little pullback. So keep an eye out for, for those stocks. Uh, as I said in the Facebook group, in the Landry list, some of those weed, weed stocks are bottoming out. Maybe we could find some opportunities there. What else is going on? Let's take a look at the semiconductors. As you can see, a little bit of an opening gap reversal today. That's why we're playing that SOX S. But longer term, I do not want to be fighting this trend. Okay, that's just a little day trade. And ideally, I'd much prefer them to gap lower like this within the trend and then take that kind of trade as opposed to these trades against the trend. So as you go through these sectors and do that at your own leisure, I'd recommend you do that every day. But a lot of areas, software, internet, quite a few banging out new highs and some with vigor. Okay, what is the best time to trade day four hour? What is the best time to trade day four hour? I'm not sure what you're asking. I trade, sometimes I put in trades on the close, literally on the close, because that's what the pattern calls for, the setup calls for. Sometimes I put on trades shortly after the open because that's when it triggered or that's when, if I'm playing like an opening gap reversal, that's when it happens. But I don't pick any particular times. I wanna, f well, I thought about that too, four hour chart. No, I prefer a daily chart, okay, for my charting. And we're looking to capture that longer term game, but we're also looking to capture a swing trade out. But patterns are fractal, okay? So there are some things, you might be trading a five minute bow tie on something, right? Not my cup of tea. Maybe in something like Forex, I'll trade like an hourly, although I haven't done it in a while, but I might trade like an hourly chart. It just doesn't seem to be really worth my while. Last few trades I made really hadn't worked out. But that's something that you might consider if you're trading short term. Trade maybe a more inefficient, I'm sorry, maybe a more efficient market like Forex shorter term on those hourly charts or five minute charts or whatever, whatever floats your boat. But for the most part, I find that daily is the best way to trade because we're looking to capture that daily swing trade followed by the, hopefully, there's that word again, longer term trend. Okay, let's go ahead and, okay, GTT, yeah, GTT is kind of interesting in here. Let's back the, start, back the chart out a little bit. You know, it's bottomed out. It's made a major, major low, uh, first thrust higher. A little bit too many days in the pullback for me. But it's kind of interesting. I mean, I know the RUHN kept pulling back and we stuck with it. 
So not bad. If you're long, yeah, absolutely. Stay long on that one. But uh, I wouldn't enter a new position on this one. Okay. Chris wants to talk about BLDP. What Chris is that? There's so many Chris's in the group. We go through Don's. Now we're going through Chris's. <laughs> Chris P, Chris A, Chris A. Okay. Uh, BLDP. Nice longer term trend. I'll be a bit choppy, but nice acceleration recently. Let's back the chart way out. Yeah, I hear you on that. Um, and you know, there's nothing wrong with those kind of boring trends like that. I mean, that one's not too boring though, but if you could figure out a way to get on these longer term trends and just sit in there forever, by all means. But yeah, maybe on the next pullback, it might be worth a shot. That's a decent trend. Work, which is slack, I think. Work was one of those turd IPOs, but now it's beginning to kind of get its act together. So I think it looks okay. Let's check the bow ties. Oops, I fat fingered something. I don't even know what that is. Yeah, it's a bow tie. Um, it's kind of stealthy. I, I I prefer if it was a little bit more serious kind of run, but I think I think it's something worth a shot. Uh, I'm a little on the fence with it, but for the most part, I don't know. It looks like they got their act together, maybe enter above the high and then a stop down a little bit towards the lows in here. But yeah, I think that's pretty good. So good uh, good call on that one. Okay, Rose says, for screening the stock, which are the most important factors to look at, like PE, volume, delta, and what more? Okay, well, that's something that took me 14 hours to explain, okay, in a, in a stock selection course. But the quick answer is, first of all, um, I'm not sure what a PE is, but no, I'm kidding aside. I know what a PE is. A lot of times I was like, what's a stochastic? And then I'll get a four-page email from somebody who's like, I know what a stochastic is. It's being facetious. I do use the PE, but I don't use the E part of the PE. I just use the P part, okay? I just use the numerator, and that's all you need to worry with. And the occasional moving average. You, If you go back and look at those stocks I just talked about, rows where we had persistency and we had acceleration and we had nice little obvious TKOs lower and all of these other things and these really nice trends over a fairly short period of time. If you look for all of those things, you're going to be well on your way. Okay. Now I do have some loose parameter scans I can give you in telechart and stock charts is working on some scans for me. And Metastock also has scans that are a little bit more specific so if you wanted some more specific scans you could look to stock charts or meta stock but for me i just like looking at a lot of stocks and my pullback scan right now is producing about 1700 stocks okay yeah it's profit yeah i know i know what a pe is i don't use it it's um there's no hard and fast concrete rule when it comes to fundamentals you can't say you want to buy a stock with a pe of x or y or whatever but with technical analysis, if a market's going to go from A to C, as I preach, and C is higher than A, it's going to have to pass through B along the way. So not that you can always just buy at B, although we do do that in IPOs, you're going to be much better off buying as a market is going up than trying to buy some sort of value or something. I'm not going to pick on any value guys, but occasionally their funds lose about half of their value. And to me, I don't, that doesn't make sense, okay? S-E-E-L, which is similar to G-T-T. I saw one of the, you know, sometimes when they when they do such an implosion, uh, I'm not as excited about them, but I hear you, okay? If you just showed me this part of the chart, I'd say it looked pretty good. It's kind of reversing a little bit in here. I would almost say there's a little bit of a breakout characteristic to this that might be worth a shot, but I think it's a little dangerous to trade. I mean, you would have to be willing to risk a dollar forty-seven a share on that one. In other words, <laughs> worst case scenario, you got a dollar buck and a half stop. So I tread lightly on something like that. HV up above a hundred, kind of dangerous, but good eye, good eye though, Chris P. 
Thanks a lot, Coach Sagar. Yeah, Rose, I'll fix you up. I'll, I'll give you enough to keep you busy for a long time. DCPH. And, you know, keep in mind, I mean, I'm coming across a little um, braggadocious maybe today, but, you know, it's not my way or the highway, but it's the best thing I've found after quite a bit of searching. This gap here is a little bit kind of extreme, but that was a ways back, like Zach was pointing out, not as relevant because it's a little ways back. It looks okay, but now you've got almost too many days in the pullback with this one. But I'd say, I'd say, I'd still give it an okay. Okay, Chris A. I mean, you could certainly do a lot worse than that. A, I've never made a dime in this stupid stock. I don't know why. I guess because it's so thick. Okay. And you can see it tends to be like an electrocardiogram, but I hear you. It's gotten its act together in more recent times. But low volatility, thick, eh, I think. I think you're better off going after something a little bit more speculative as opposed to that. But yeah, I hear you. And you know, HV is down around 13. I like stocks, as you know, with HV closer or much well above the market. Let's see what the spiders are real quick. Well, spiders are seven, lower than I thought they would be. The persistency, now persistency will pull out volatility, okay? So that's something you do have to watch for is volatility will drop. I mean, this one's okay. I prefer it if it weren't, if it hadn't pulled back below this prior peak in here. I think if you went through the drugs, you could probably find something a little bit better. I'm still seeing biotechs setting up. So it looks okay, but I think I would pass on that one in, in lieu of something possibly better or trying to find something better. AIMT. Our first Don today. <laughs> we used to have a plethora of Dons. Now it's Chris's. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Um, you don't have too many bad memories, so I'm not going to worry too much about that. I do like the TKO. I do like the persistency. So I think since I haven't given out a high five today, a little wide and loose getting started, but nice and persistent accelerating now. I'd actually like to see a little bit more knockout here. But yeah, I think that looks pretty good. I think a great trade here, Donald, would be tomorrow if we have a nice gap lower, like a gap down to 30 or something. That'd be a beautiful opening gap reversal, hopefully in the back, back of the direction of the trend. I just said hope again. I'm going to give you all. Richie's got me all cognizant of that. So, yeah, good job on that. I'll give you a high five. And by the way, most of the stocks today, or nearly all the stocks today, are pretty good, good look, look, pretty good looking stocks, easy for me to say. So you guys and girls have come a long ways. I'm proud of you. All right, looks like I am out of time. I appreciate you guys and girls being here. I'm glad you guys found the show. If you have any unanswered questions, shoot me an email. I will be scheduling a Q&A session soon for those who are members of daylander.com. So if you do have some, if I need questions, okay? The Facebook group has been really doing a good job of answering them. So I'm happy with that, but I still need questions for the Q&A. So let me know if you have any questions. If we don't talk to you now and then, everybody have a fantastic weekend. Thank you so much.